Hi there, and I would like to welcome you once again to Unstoppable Mindset. I am your host, Mike Hingson. Really glad you're here. We get to chat today with Pyle Nanjiani, who is, as she describes herself, an Indian American, having come from India and now working in both places, India and North Carolina. So where I am right now in Southern California, it's just a little after eight in the morning. And for her, it's like after 9.30 at night. So we don't want to keep you up too late, but we really would like to welcome you to Unstoppable Mindset. Thanks very much for being here. Thanks, Michael. It's such an honor to be here with you and have this conversation. Well, I'm looking forward to it. I think we'll have some fun. And of course, that's one of the rules that I always tell people who are going to be guests on Unstoppable Mindset. It's no good if you don't have fun. So we got to have fun doing this. Yes, and I've always had fun talking with you on the call and on this podcast. It's always been a, been fun talking with you. Oh, good. Well, I appreciate that. Well, why don't we start? I love to begin this way. Why don't you tell us a little bit about you growing up and where you came from and all those kinds of things? Uh, so if I just go back a little bit, uh, you know, in the past, I come, uh, Michael, I come from a very loving family, very humble family where... Education is the highest priority. Okay. And so, uh, uh, you know, after completing my, uh, my undergrad, I went to a B school and I went to the B school, not because I had a passion for it, but purely because I was seduced by the culture and the society in India, where they would say that if you have an MBA degree under your belt, well, life is pretty much set. Uh, and so I, I did that and then later on uh, moved moved to uh, America. And this was somewhere in 1996, moved to America. And then I started working in joint corporate America. So, um, you know, years went by and um, uh, I was I was just swamped managing my work in uh, in corporate America, living the so-called American dream at that point of time. But there was always, um, uh, you know, there was always a feeling of unfulfillment. And uh, I remember my, uh, you know, my, my dad is somebody who has um, had a very, very crucial role in my in my career. You know, he's so I, I'll just take you back a little bit more. So in India, uh, you know, there is not much importance. And in those years in 1996, there was not so much importance given to the career of a girl child. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, so yeah, that's how the culture was at that point of time, and it's totally different right now because now I'm in India after 25 years of here. I see the totally difference in the culture. But in those days when this was not happening, um, I remember my dad really thought out of the box, and he went against the society and everything, and he would keep pushing me that this is what you're supposed to do. You must grow in your career. You know, he would send me cutouts and, and pictures of uh, men and women who had made it big in their career. And he, he would send it to me so that I see it and realize that anything is possible in the world. Doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman. So at constantly, his push was there that, you know, think about your career, think about growth, think about what you can do. You can achieve just anything that you put your mind and your heart on. And uh, he said, just put your dream out there and your body will follow, your heart will follow. And uh, that's exactly what happened. So a lot of my career got shaped because of my dad and his complete push during that point of time. And uh, then, like I said, I came to corporate America, I started working. And then there was this feeling of unfulfillment that, uh, yeah, you know, we are in a country which is full of information, full of resources. And. And still there is lack of opportunities. Sorry, we have a lack of opportunities and still people are struggling at work. There's a huge difference between um, people who are really successful and people who are not. Mm -hmm. And who are still working hard but not getting there. And um, my dad would always tell me, again, I come back to him because a lot of my, my work has come from him. So he would always tell me that, uh, you know, uneasiness uneasiness inside of you is a blessing it's really good because it can change the trajectory of your life and make you do things which you otherwise would not and uh, that un, uh, uneasiness that why am i seeing this gap in a place which is a land of opportunities why am i seeing this gap 
That's when I left the comfort of a well-settled corporate America life and immersed in research of what is the root cause of the difference between successful uh, few and the unsuccessful many. And when I say unsuccessful, I don't mean in terms of money or positions. What I mean is the term of fulfillment and what you can achieve. Are you achieving what you want or you're not? And all of this began, that research and everything became the springboard for success within coaching and leadership, which I started. So that's a little bit about my my uh, career path and, yes. my, and my growing isn't it interesting how often when we think or we look at what happens in our lives, how it comes back to our parents pushed us. They wanted us to be better. And a lot of times I hear people say that their parents wanted them to have more opportunities than they, the parents had, or that they didn't, the parents didn't get the schooling that they would like their children to have. It's fascinating how often that is and how right that is because that's what parents do right absolutely absolutely and and i'm sure even when you go back in your life you would always be able to connect the dots that there was someone who was always pushing you and somebody who was always inspiring you to do more oh and in my book thunderdog that we wrote after the world trade center and was published in 2011 um, we talk about that because my parents were told when I was born and it was discovered about four months later that I was blind, my parents were told to send me to a home because no blind child could ever grow up and amount to anything. And my parents said, you're absolutely wrong. He will be able to grow up to do whatever he wants. And they operated that way. Um, and I think that happens so often with parents. Um, the parents that really make that leap, there are so many who don't, but the parents who make that leap and say, I really am going to work hard to make it possible for my child to be all the things maybe that, that I wasn't, or at least some of the things that I wasn't able to do. And I think it's so cool when that, when I hear that story, um, because it does, it does absolutely um, cause something to stir in me. And, and it makes me remember all the more how wonderful my parents were and how how loving my family was to me as well. So I appreciate it very much. Absolutely. And, you know, when you're speaking about this, it's reminding me, uh, I had read about uh, Nick Vujicic, uh and how uh, without limbs, he had, uh, you know, he has made himself very independent and in all thanks he gives to his parents. So, yeah. Yeah. And it, and it, and it's appropriate with that. Well, so, um, when you came over here, how was it different in um, America, corporate-wise and work-wise, than it was in India? You said 1996 you came over. So around that time, how was it different between the two cultures, or was it really? Uh, yes. You know, if, if you talk about uh, a personal culture versus professional culture, I think both of them are very different. Um, in, in a personal culture, uh, you know, uh, India is a uh, is a place which is very close knit in family, very close knit. So there's a support system that is built in families. You never have that feeling of aloneness or loneliness, and you can really depend on one another. Parents and children, children and parents, grandparents, aunts, uncle, everybody is very interconnected. You know, there's a lot of uh, uh, support system that you build. It's it's like a complete. Uh, 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 you know, you know, someone has your back in the family all the time. Versus when in the United States, um, uh, what I notice a lot is you have to be self-dependent. And I think both cultures have their own uh, advantages. You have to be very self-dependent. You cannot have a huge family around. And, uh, you know, you, you, you can, you, your parents and children have, have a limit where they are with each other. After some time, the child grows. And my both children are born and brought up completely in the United States. So, you know, after a certain period of time, they go go to their uh, high school and they go to the college, the universities, and life is, life is becoming independent for them as well as the parents. So I think that's one cultural, uh, cultural difference that I have seen. And the other professionally, what I have seen is... Um, we have so much of resources in the United States 
uh, and we have so much of learning and development and uh, uh, you know the market is so mature when it comes to leadership when it comes to coaching whereas india is an emerging market uh, it's an emerging market nevertheless it has it has reached to great heights in the in, in many fields that we see and um, i think overall overall the globalization in which we are uh, michael these days each country whether it is india america each country is learning from from each other nobody is independent right now nobody is a solo country so we are constantly imbibing each other's culture like now i see in the united states i see there is uh, there are so many articles being floated where teens you know teens um, uh, or those or the youth who are going into colleges are preferring not to stay in the dorms but to stay at home with parents so i think each culture is learning from each other quite interwoven yeah i do hear in america so often though i did it or i need to do this alone and we haven't yet learned the level of in interdependence um that really would strengthen us because in reality teams are really what it's all about and having um, a real team effort implies and in a sense demands interdependence and there's nothing wrong with that absolutely so just with what you said what reminds me is um uh, i remember one day i was making my daughter learn history my older one and uh, the entire history was american history whereas in india you learn about uh, you learn about history or you learn about geography and it entails the world right and uh, here she is learning the geography or the history only of america and that's the world for her so i think like what you said you know there is a lot of independence and this is who we are which i think uh you know in 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 ways everything i feel has its own advantages i don't think anyone is right or wrong but now with so much of globalization we're just learning from each other yeah um it has to be that way i think it was gandhi who once said interdependence is and ought to be as much the ideal of man as is self sufficiency and i think he's absolutely right i learned that at an early age working with a guide dog um and people don't really understand what guide dogs do and what they don't do guide dogs and their handlers their masters if you will work as a team yes. and the dog's job is to make sure that i walk safely but the dog doesn't know where i want to go and the dog doesn't know how to get there and i don't want the dog to know that because i want the dog to focus on what it's supposed to do which is to make sure we walk safely but it's an interdependent team and we both have to absolutely just like with any team respect each other's jobs correct and uh, professionally i'll add one more thing uh, mm -hmm. michael is that uh, uh, in india is because i work now in india also i do a lot of these coachings and leadership programs in india what i've started to notice is that many companies most of the companies in india they invest in short term trainings okay short term training programs and um, uh, and the, and they're not committed to long term development of the uh, leaders while in the united states when i'm working with corporate america doing these coaching and training programs what i've noticed is that our focus is more on the long term development of the people the long term development of their leaders with the primary objective of helping them reach their full potential and i think this is something that you know i've been trying and and it's been successful to a large extent of helping companies in india to think long term when it comes to developing their leaders yeah well there's there's value in that because um training is is an investment or it should be and yeah. i think a lot of a lot of times people don't recognize that or look at it that way and again there's no right or wrong but there is there is what will help a company and a team be better and so the idea of talking about and thinking about long-term investment makes a lot of sense absolutely i agree so you came to the us and um where did you go to work what did you start to do oh so that's that i don't even remember now but yeah many places you know most of them were government places and um slowly i uh, ran into so i i didn't work much i 
working by the year of 2008 or 2007, I stepped out of corporate America to get to do what I'm doing. So my memories are more fresher on what I have been doing after yeah. that uh, rather than what I've been doing. But yeah, more mainly I was with government agencies and uh, school districts and uh, becoming the regional head before I even stepped out. All right. And what made you decide to switch to going into coaching um, and um, helping corporate America as a consultant and so on? Uh, same as what? when I started, Michael, uh, with that question. One question that I was constantly having in my mind is that what creates the gap between where we are and where we want to be? Everybody has that gap. But for some people, Michael, that gap is so huge and it never gets filled. And uh, the gap between where you are and where you want to be in your career is the most killing gap in a person's life. They do everything to get there, but it just doesn't happen. And ultimately, I saw people resign, they leave, uh, they, it comes to the end of their career, and they are so unfulfilled. They just feel they went from one position to another, one role to another, one company to another, but they really did not become what they wanted to become. They did not make the difference that they wanted to, for which they signed up. So that continuous question of how do you fill this gap? How can every individual fill this gap between where they are and where they want to be made me realize what it takes. And that's where the entire success within leadership and coaching program had started. It's interesting how many people say they want to be successful and the, their view of success is how much money they get and yeah. how much money they earn. And when they get it, they want more. And And the real question is, have they really become successful because they've earned a lot of money? And I'm, and I'm hearing you and I understand what you're saying and I appreciate it a great deal that it's great to talk about how much money you earn, but is that really right. being successful? And it's not. Successful is, do you feel that you're really living up to your potential and your self-worth? Very right. I agree. And so um, that is what you teach primarily, right, is, is getting people to recognize their idea of their own personal value. And I don't mean that in a negative egotistical way, but where they are really living in their own mind up to their potential, right? Yeah, more so, uh, uh, you know, there is this thing which I have always been speaking about aloud is that your success, leadership, specifically success, is, is an inner game. You really cannot win outside if from inside you are broken. If you're inside, you don't know what how to lead yourself. It is so imperative. Working with so many of these executives, you know, so for example, I'll give you a very quick example. How many of us really in the workforce while we are working, we believe and we practice things like following your gut, you know, really believing mm -hmm. your gut. Some of these top executives, Michael, they have a lot of belief in their gut feelings. They, they go with it rather than just going with data and information. Uh, so how many of us believe that? How many of us are willing to put out what we want? really what we want to achieve out there in the universe, knowing that the universe listens and then how do you get that back? Yeah. So uh, my major, major work, Michael, comes in helping people to change their behaviors and their thinking patterns and to really become the best version of themselves. That's where the game changing happens. All too often, we get confronted with a problem or we get confronted with something and um, as you put it, our gut or our mind or our heart gives us a solution. Mm -hmm. But we say to ourselves, oh, that's way too easy. It can't be that simple. And we look for something else and we come up with something else. And it turns out that what our mind, our heart, our gut told us was really the right solution all along. But we seem to have a really hard time ever catching up to that and learning, go with your gut. Um, and and uh, my favorite example is Trivial Pursuit, the game. How often do you get asked a question in Trivial Pursuit and you're, you suddenly have an answer, but you go, oh, that can't be it. And when you go with something else, turns out that that was the right answer in the first place. And we don't seem to really want to learn from those kinds of issues. How do we change that? 
Yeah, you're right. We don't learn from them. We can, we don't pay attention to them. So there was this nice movie. I'm not sure if you've had a chance, an opportunity to watch it in Pursuit of Happiness. Mm -hmm. uh, have you watched that movie? I haven't, but go ahead. It's very nice. So in Pursuit of Happiness, uh, there is one scene. In the, so the entire story is based on Chris Gardner's uh, inspiring story. And the character is played very well by Will Smith. And there is one uh, uh, one scene I remember where he talks to his child and he says, never let anyone talk you out of your dreams. And the question I was asking myself at that time is, more than the people, it is we who walk ourselves out of our dreams. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, each of us, we, we you know, we, we have to, you know, we build two walls inside of ourselves. One wall is the wall of doubt and a uh, uh, wall of doubt which is created by outside. The people will tell us, you know, this is not correct. And you build that wall. But there's another wall that we built inside ourselves, which is built by us. And that is the most difficult wall to build because it is built from inside of you and you're very strong over it. So every time you have a self-doubt, you, you don't take time to reflect, you're going to get caught up in the noisy corporate world. And you're not going to have time to really come out of the things. So if you're really looking at ways on how you can really improve, how you can really work on yourself, you have to give time to yourself. You have to give time to yourself. Um, I'll tell you a story, Michael, which I'll tell you very quickly. It's about this king who has four wives. And um, on, on one, one late evening in the dark, uh, the, the Lord of Death comes to him and asks him, tells him that it is time for him to leave. So the king says, oh, I don't feel like leaving. He says, no, but it's time for you. You have to leave all of this kingdom, the money, the wealth, the name, fame, everything, and you have to come with me. So um, the king says, okay, at least give me one more day. So the Lord of Death says, fine, I'll give you one more day. And uh, the next morning, uh, you know, uh, no, not the next one, the same night, uh, the king calls one of his wife and he says, look, the Lord of Death came to take, take me and don't want to go alone. I want you to come with me. The wife says, no, I cannot come there with you. I love where I am. I love this kingdom. Are you, you please go, go alone. So he feels very sad. He says, I've done so much for you. And this is what you tell me. So he calls the second wife. Second wife, he says the same thing. He gets the same answer. She says, I cannot come. Calls the third wife. Third wife says the same answer. And the king is very dejected, very feels very, very alone. And he's like, I've done so much for all of them. And this is what I get in return. Nobody wants to come with me. So he's sitting in the dark, mourning and feeling sad and you know, thinking of what's going to happen the next day when the Lord of Death comes. That's when he hears a voice. And that voice says, very subtly, the voice says, you don't worry. I'm going to come with you tomorrow when the Lord of Death comes to take you. So he looks and he sees a very feeble looking figure and he says, who are you? She says, hey, I'm your fourth wife. So he says, oh, really? You look so feeble. You look so weak. And she says, oh, yeah, you forgot about me, I guess, but I can come with you tomorrow. And that's the time he feels really sad. He says, I neglected her. I did not pay attention to her. And here she is willing to come with me. The entire moral is that in our corporate world, you know, in our, in, our, in our corporate life, we are also like the king who has four wives. The first wife is our company and we give everything to the company and in, you know, ultimately not realizing that we're supposed to leave the company one day and we'll change it, we'll go somewhere else. The second is our teams, you know, we, we get very attached to our, you know, we do everything for our teams to motivate them, but ultimately we don't. We know that the steam is going to change. We are going to move somewhere else. Third is our positions, our titles. We, again, give so much of you, so attached to them that that becomes, it defines us. We don't know who we are if we don't have a title, if we don't have a role. We just don't know who we are. All of this is going to leave us. And the fourth one is we ourselves, which I call as the inner leader. It's a concept I had introduced for which I got recognized. It's called the inner leader. You are going to take yourself with you everywhere. Your inner leader is going to accompany you everywhere. So you have to pay so much of attention, so much of attention to it, so that wherever you are, whatever the circumstances, you can come out strong. So that's the whole 
idea of this entire concept. That's a great story. And it is it is so true. We don't look at ourselves. We don't spend time every day looking at what we did, how it worked out, why it worked out the way it is, what can we do to change it, how does it really help us. Um, we, in this country at least, so seem to not want to look at introspection and self-analysis on anything and everything we do, which is so unfortunate, isn't it? Absolutely. We are so busy with so many achievements, Michael. <laughs> yeah, that it, that it makes it really sort of difficult for us. But the reality is, it is part of our lives, and we should be studying what we have done and how it's worked out. Even the things at which we're successful, how can we make them better? What can we really do? But it's the internal part of us that we need to look at most of all. And we, we in this country, keep saying, well, I don't have time to stop and do that. Well, yes, you do if you make the time. And it's just something that we just tend not to really like to do very much. So do you take the time, Michael, like to introspect and everything? Every night. Wow. More more at night than in the morning. Um, in the morning, I have a cat who... <laughs> okay. In the morning, I have a cat who wakes me up, and she wants to eat first. And um, but no, I I do I do that at night. Love. I do that at night, and I and I actually often think about it during the day. But yes, because I've learned to to do that, and I value yeah. that time. It's important to do that, isn't it? Yeah, isn't it? It just gives you so much of control over yourself and your day. And it's not a bad thing. And you're not looking to say how great I am. You're looking at um, how am I doing and how am I doing? And really the the inner I, as much as anything, the I am that tells me what to do. Absolutely. So you um, you started, you, you moved here and then you started your coaching program. I think you said in what, 2006 or 2007, and you've mm -hmm. been doing it ever since. Yeah. Um, so you started in, in America to do that. But you've also added doing coaching in India. What prompted that and how has that worked out? It must be somewhat different still. Yeah, and I'm very grateful for that question, uh, Michael, because that's a question which is extremely close to my heart. Uh, so like you said, yeah, for 21 years, I've been working and helping corporate America and the Western world develop, uh, uh, you know, leaders, world-class leaders and live up to their potential. And um, during that time, I remember every time that I would travel to India to, uh, you know, I I, uh, I was invited to speak at companies or do these high-end executive coachings. So every time I would travel to India, I noticed that there was a big problem. And that was that, uh, which was that uh, corporate America was still, sorry, corporate India was still following the concept of trained leaders, you know, where leadership is based on position titles where there's a lot of focus on skills and um, India, India was still getting recognized as uh, for churning out MBAs and engineers rather than churning out leaders who can think like leaders and grow an organization. Um, so I decided to unite my vision with the Prime Minister and the now, the now India's Prime Minister, Mr. Narendra Modi, and his vision of India being a developed country. So that's where I merged my vision and it became one of the biggest purpose of my life. And that, that's what I have come down to India for. You know, a massive chunk of the economic growth of a nation, any nation comes from the organization, how many leaders they have in the organization and how they can take the organization and the youth. And uh, I have seen that India has excellent talent, rich talent, a considerable workforce, which is growing. And when this workforce develops itself into world-class leaders, it significantly impacts not only the organization's growth, but also the economic development of a country. So personally, Michael, I feel really very honored and very, uh, uh, you know, humbly, I would say that I feel very honored and proud that I'm now associating myself not with only corporate America, but also organizations and youth 
here in India so that they can become the best version of themselves. They can be inspired to do more and they can learn what it takes to be, you know, the best version of themselves. So, yeah, that's exactly where it all started from. It just started with this purpose. But are you still doing that in America as well? Or are you really focusing yes. now? Okay, so you do both. Both, yes, yes. The only difference is first I used to travel from America to India. Now I travel from India to America. Yeah. And you have a That's home in both difference. and you have a I home have in both home. places. Yes, yes, I do. So you get to uh to 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 travel. It's a long, a long flight, but uh yeah. That uh, that's okay, um, as long as yeah, you, yeah, you get to do that. Absolutely, I'm so, sure you enjoy traveling too. I do enjoy traveling. It's actually a time that I get to sit and think because I I deliberately try not to do a lot of work when I travel, um, be uh, on on airplanes especially because I think that's a great time to sit and relax and reflect and think. And so I do I try to do that as opposed to yeah. I love to read. I read a lot in the. Planes. Uh, my my books. I write my books in the plane. <laughs> yeah, I've done that too, but I I, I jo enjoy that as opposed to doing work. You know, you get on the airplane, and the first thing you do is grab your computer, and the next thing you know, you're landing and you've done this work or or whatever. But you don't relax at all, and then you get there and you're tired and you wonder why. Yeah. <laughs> so, what what are the differences today? in coaching in India as opposed to coaching in North America or in the United States? Mm, or are there? there's a, no, there is not. A, uh, I think, like I said, in India, uh, the market is still becoming very mature. It is not, not a very mature market yet. It is still developing. Um, in uh, in the United States, I have seen that it is still, it is a very, very matured market, right? It is basically uh, people are aware of coaching, people are uh, aware of the process of coaching. So for example, in America, while I'm coaching somebody in the United States, I feel it is something that they are looking forward to, that yes, we need a coach. Versus in India, we are still, uh, I'm seeing people try to push it away. They feel that there's something lacking in me. That is why I need a coach. There must be some problem in me. Uh, whereas in America, it's like, wow, I have a coach. I have an opportunity to develop myself much more. So I think that's one of the differences because it's an emerging market. And um, the other thing that I have noticed is, a lot of a lot of people believe that if you take a certification course in coaching, that's it. You you become a coach. So there are hundreds and thousands of them out there, and it's so difficult in that noise to pinpoint exactly who is the correct one for you. And I think whenever people are looking at coaches, you need to see the credentials. You need to see what all they have impacted, who all they have impacted, what is the work that has gone behind, how well can they take care of your career and of you as a person, as an individual, because. Ultimately, it is some, you know, it is somebody's career you're, you're you're taking care of. So I think that are some of the differences that I have uh, noticed. As a person who spent a lot of their life in sales, obviously in India the opportunity is greater. Although it takes a lot of education, but is it harder because there is more opportunity and less understanding of what coaches do, or? Is it harder in America because there are so many coaches and you have to really filter to get to the right person? Sounds like yeah, two different kinds of challenges. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's I challenges in both places because in both places you have to filter it out um, as to who's who and who has done what work for for your creditability. So yes, absolutely. So it um, there are differences, but but still it amounts to the same thing and. When you have a breakthrough and and somebody truly understands, then you have a breakthrough, which is really wonderful to uh, to be able to to have that. So for you, that must be part of what the inner you really likes is when you do have those breakthroughs and you you get someone who really gets it. Hmm. How do you keep up with all of the changes in? and trends and best practices in coaching and developing leaders and how do you implement them? 
How do I keep up? Well, uh, Michael, I truly believe that if your cup is not filled, you cannot pour from an empty cup. Right, so uh, you have to fill up your cup before you pour into someone else. So I spend a whooping seventy percent of my time on myself, and when I say on myself, what I mean is on developing myself, on keeping up with what I need to learn before I can even share it with someone else. So it's that's my simplest answer that I can give you is that I work a lot on myself before I work with others or on others. What do you do a lot of reading or is it thinking or what do you do? Yeah. Yeah. Everything reading, seeing what's new, researching, uh, uh, you know, keeping up with the time, seeing what changes are happening. Uh, so for example, I also teach at various colleges, you know, and that makes me understand what is the youth looking at. Uh, you know, that's the only way I can understand what new, which new mindsets are entering into the workforce. What is, what are they thinking? What are, what are their likes and dislikes like? What are we bringing into the workforce? Sitting here in a closed room, I cannot understand that. So that's the type of work that you have to do on yourself before you go out there and say, I can help you. Mm -hmm. So filling you, my cup. I'm sorry? Filling my cup more. Filling your cup more, yes. Do you uh, find when you're teaching, um, sometimes it's a, a challenge just to stay ahead of the the kids in the classroom? Absolutely, yeah. they are such great minds. They are such great minds, both here and both here and in America. Such great minds, questions, hunger for learning, you know, quick learning because they are in an instant age of uh, uh, social media. So they are very instant in everything. So you learn to pick up speed from them. Yeah, their their incredible desire to learn and just the enthusiasm has to be a wonderful thing to experience. And and I know that every time people ask me questions, um, I know that they just want to learn. And I love curiosity and I wish we had more of it. All too often, I think in this country, we don't encourage curiosity, especially with little children. They get sheltered so much and they don't get to explore and be as curious as it would It would be helpful for them to be. No, I think in fact, um, uh, I, I see quite opposite. In America, we do have a lot of curiosity where we promote questions, where we do promote uh, uh, experimentation. Uh, and I think the education system um, may not be to that extent, but Overall, as compared to other parts of the world that I have been in, I feel uh, in America, we do have, have an open education system, which is more on your curiosity and your 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 learning. At least with, with my two kids growing up there and, you know, finishing their uh, uh, undergrad there, at least that's what I have uh, experienced. And that's great. That's That's exciting to hear because we don't learn if we're not curious. Absolutely. Well, well, what? Go ahead. In in uh, in our world today, what would you say are the key qualities that define a successful leader? Hmm. Uh, you know, people talk about being leaders. They, you know, I'm a leader, uh, and all too often, I think what. Uh, they really are as a boss and not necessarily a leader. But what what really is a leader in in America or or India or um, anywhere in the world? Because I would think that the the answer ultimately is pretty similar wherever you go. Yeah, yeah. I think that, uh, what comes on top of my mind, what I teach people, uh, three three things. So number one is you have to have a winning mindset. We have way too many people these days, Michael, who are wanting to work hard and just give their best. But I think the world has moved on now. You have to know how to go beyond your best. That is very necessary. Second, I would say is um, you have to be very relentless in your game. You cannot have a, you know, you have to have a never give up attitude. You have to know how to stay in the game longer. Challenges are going to be coming. You're going to make, you know, going to have those obstacles. But every single day, are you waking up 
thinking that you know that's it i've i've had had it and i've tried it a lot it doesn't work or are you the one who says okay it's just another day another try another day another try and you just keep on going in the game you strategize you re-strategize and you just know that you are not going to throw in the towel over there and i know number 3 which is very very crucial these days specifically post covid is that you have to have control over your mind you have to have control over your mind over your emotions something my mom has taught me right from the beginning that those who cannot control their own mind can never control or take charge of anything else so if you are not able to control your mind if you are not in charge of your own emotions then guess what you're going to allow everyone and everything to disturb you and in these times we anything can disturb us just go on social media and you'll be disturbed so don't be a victim don't be a slave to people's behavior and circumstances otherwise you're going to be on everybody's agenda so i, I the, the, according to me these three to begin with if if we can imbibe these three it can take us a long way have a winning mindset be relentless in your game and control your mind and take charge of your emotions how do let, let's look at number 3 a little bit how do you do that how you know people say but we're emotional that's what human beings are how do we learn to take more control and how do we really learn to control our own minds yeah i mean we are emotional beings no doubt about it we should be emotional beings we are we you know even like we say even animals have emotions so emotion is a is a given it's it's god gifted to everybody when i say control your emotions or take charge of your emotions what i mean is you can't be allowing every little thing around you to disturb you you can say my happiness so for example say in the morning you wake up and you decide oh it's a great day and i am going to be really happy today and you're driving to work you reach work and your boss tells you hey you know what you've done a fantastic work on this project we are really proud of you so you're you know you feel more happier you feel more happier when you hear this and then after some time someone comes and tells you you know the sales are going down and our stakeholders are complaining you should have been more careful there goes your emotions now you are feeling down all the time now how do you get back to that happy zone well you will not be able to get back to that happy zone until somebody else comes and tells you something more better that can take your emotions a little more uh, you know onto the higher level so we call this as rca reality check analysis that you have to know exactly how to come back to the emotion that you wanted to stay with and i can guarantee you michael if you know we call it as a remote control if each of us were in control of our emotions we have that remote with us we would do so much bigger and better we would not let other things disturb us we would not let our energy drain in what he said and she said and how did they make us feel and you would just know that how to come back how to come back and and how to get started and how to move ahead by keeping the remote with you so I think one of the major things to start with is to be conscious of who all have you given your remote to and do you plan to keep the remote with you want mm-hmm. to make that conscious decision that yes my remote is with me i have decided consciously to be in a state of happiness in a state of winning mindset you will not allow people to easily take control over you 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 actually hit on i think the most crucial point what you described was a person who decided to be happy but then they went to work and they they heard something that made them more happy but then someone came along and made them unhappy and what i'm hearing you say is you don't need to lose your happiness your emotion of joy just because someone came along and said something that's negative Uh, my immediate reaction to that would have been and and actually has been at times well let's look at what really is going on here and if there's something that i need to fix i will go fix it but i'm not going to lose my happiness over it it's going to help me become more strategic and um and take more responsibility if that's what i need to do or if there is something somewhere else that needs to be addressed then i want to try to help that where i can but i can't worry about things over which i don't have control 
Absolutely. And that's why I tell people, I said, it is, it's, it's, you know, your work environment is not because of your boss or something. So many people say, oh, I'm working in a very toxic work environment or it's very negative. Well, what's your contribution to it? There's a yeah. lot of negativity coming into the organization because of you too. So what's your contribution? Yeah. And that's exactly right. You have control over some things. And I, I know in this country, all too often, people focus way too much on so many things over which they have no control. And you know, we allow things like social media and everything else to affect us. I hear a lot about cyberbullying and how children, youth are are affected by that. And I understand it. But what we don't learn is how to be able to truly step back. Um, and, and I hate to use this word, but raise our defenses. Our defenses so that we don't let that affect us, but at least um, not pay attention to all of it, but rather deal with the things that we really can deal with and not worry about the rest. That's hard for us to do, um, and it's and it's so so much a problem if we don't learn how to do it. Yeah, definitely, because if you don't learn how to do it, then you're going to be on everybody's agenda. Again, you're just going to be pulled in all directions, and you just don't know who you are as a person. So in one of my books, I think the first chapter itself was who am I? You need to recognize yourself before you you know, define anybody else. How many books have you written? Three. Both one is under contract. Wow. Well, um, I think that's pretty good. And we've got pictures of book covers in the uh, podcast notes. So I hope people will go look at those. Just for fun, tell us a, um, a little bit about a typical day in the life of Pyle Nanjiani. <laughs> um, typical day. So my day, Michael, starts very early. I'm up sometimes by four. I'm up sometimes by five. Just depends on how the previous day or night has been. But um, I, I wake up very early. And when I wake up, the first thing I do, Michael, is just to be grateful. There's mm -hmm. nothing else. In the very first thing while I wake up, I'm on the bed, is I am grateful for two or three things every single day, I must say that. Which two or three things I'm grateful for. And then after I freshen up, I start my day with yoga and meditation. Uh, I'm a big believer of yoga. I'm mm -hmm. a big time in meditation. Uh, so I give myself at least an hour to do meditation and yoga. And that's my reflection time. That's the time when I go inside. And a lot of, you know, it gives you a lot of peace, especially because it's so early morning and everybody else is, you know, on this side of the world is sleeping. Yeah. So like they say that, you know, that's the most auspicious time when everything is silent and, uh, you know, the powers are the highest during that time. The earliest time of the day, the powers are the highest. So that's what my day starts. And uh, then I begin my writing, either by book writing or an article, whatever I have to write. The first two or three hours are non-negotiable for me. I'm not in the kitchen. I'm not doing housework. I'm not with my daughter. I'm not with my husband. I'm just with myself. Uh, so those two or three hours give me a lot of time on myself. And then the routine starts, you know, of of uh, of the a little bit of my housework, breakfast before I start my office meetings. Uh, I one thing in the entire day, you know, whether then I'm going to the gym, whether I'm walking, doing meetings, and then I have to go for coaching sessions, workshops, and then the whole day starts. But if there's something constant in these days, it is the first few hours in the morning which are non-negotiable, and the other is. Every single day, I make a call to my parents, come what may, just come what may. However the tough the day is, however busy and packed my schedule is, just wherever I am in the world, as long as I'm alive and good, I must make that call to my parents, just even if it is for a minute or two. Mm -hmm. Well, and you're close to them and they have helped you so much. Yeah, and I think um, all parents help their children. All parents do everything that is in their capacity to bring up their children. And, uh, you know, the least they can expect is you be in touch with them every day. They hear your voice. They know you're safe. They are good. You know they are safe. They are good. And 
I think the time that we can give our parents, you know, my mom always says that after the, you know, after people are dead, if you just put candles or flowers on their uh, picture, it doesn't make a difference. What you do while they are alive is what makes all the difference. Yeah. And that makes a lot of sense. Um, they they brought you into the world and and hopefully they spent a lot of time giving you all that they could and and helping you progress. Yes. So as a leadership expert, what motivates you to continue the work that you're doing? And um, I guess what really makes me wondering, what are your long-term goals as you go forward? What motivates me is my purpose. Like I said, getting more and more people to become successful in what they are doing in really understanding that your true success is really within you. And if you can tap that, you know, just like uh, some of these uh, world-class successful leaders that we read about, they are the ones who are tapping their inner resources more. So at the end of the day, I think it's people who make me do what I want to do. When I when someone comes to me and says, hey, you know what, your book changed my life or your podcast changed my life or your techniques helped me grow. Uh, when I get these fan messages, when I read them and I and I answer them all, I take every day, uh, sorry, every week, one one day is only to reply to the fan messages, to my followers, to my people. Uh, and that gives me immense pleasure. So I think at the end of it all, Michael, and I'm sure that's exactly what you're doing and what you believe in. That's why you are doing this podcast is uh, you want to make a difference in the number of, you know, in the lives of the people, as many as you can impact, you know, I've impacted more than a million now, and I hope to be going strong with God's grace and blessings that I can make a difference in the lives of people. I can help them. Uh, I really sincerely wish and pray that God gives me the courage, the health and everything to, to keep impacting people's life in the best way. So that at the end of it all, you know, when I'm gone from the world, what I would like to leave and go is my work because work is divine for me work is divine every single night before you sleep i before i sleep i offer my work to the lord saying that this is what i've done i hope i've done my best and i hope tomorrow is another day that i can impact more people before i leave the world so i think that's a bigger thing that i work towards i can appreciate that a great deal i think that it's it's important that we know um, and that that we learn to recognize when we're doing a good thing. You know, a lot of people can say a lot of things and a lot of people can remember us in one way or another. But I do think ultimately we have to come to understand what differences we've made and why perhaps we've made a difference and that we learn to feel positive about that or we learn to understand the value that we bring. And the other part about it is, for me, even a more exciting thing is, I don't know what seeds I'm planting that I may hear about in 10, 15, or 20 years, or or may never know about, but they're out there, or I hear about them sort of indirectly. And that's okay, as long as uh, we're having an effect. I think that's the important part about it all. And as I'm sitting here, Michael, talking with you, looking at you, I'm looking at the difference that you are making in the lives of people. You're inspiring them to do so much more. Well, and I hope that that we're we're successful with that. And I guess time will will tell um, whether anybody anybody attributes it to me directly or not. As long as it happens, that's all I can ever ask for. No, I think it'd be an awesome book. So what got you started in writing books? Uh, and that's a very fascinating uh, story. You know, for many years, uh, I, whichever company I used to be invited to speak and train, after them, that they would ask me that, do you have such more tips and practices, uh, uh, you know, which can help us more? And uh, almost every time I would say yes, and immediately following that question would be, Okay, so where do I find them? And I had no answer because I used to not put them out anywhere. 
So one evening, I remember I was flying from San Jose back home to North Carolina, where I met this one gentleman who I absolutely don't know, who approached me at the airport. And he asked me that, uh, uh, you know, are you, uh, are you, and this is exactly what he said. He said, are you that famous uh, coach, Fayel Nanjiani? And I said, yeah. And he said that he introduced himself. He said, I've seen you, I've watched you on television in some interviews. And uh, he introduced himself, I remember at that time, as a director of some mid-sized firm. And uh, he said, you know, he works hard. He does everything that he could. A few of my techniques had helped him grow in the company. He said, but I don't see anything else where I can get some more techniques from you. And, you know, you're associating yourself with so many great leaders and successful people in the world. Don't you think there should be more out there from you for people like us who do <laughs> not have direct access to you? And that prompted me to think on the way back home in that flight is when I was thinking that in what other way could I do it? And I'm not a very social media person. You know, I don't have that time to sit and put yeah much on social media, though my team does a great job now. So people do connect with me on Instagram and on LinkedIn where we post. But those years, book is what came to my mind that why don't I start writing? And I had no idea of how do I write a book? What do I do? And Michael, you would be surprised. There were 22 book rejections. Mm, not surprised. Yeah, for the 23rd attempt was one that one of the uh, publishers, Mike, you know, um, Routledge Publishers in New York, they accepted the manuscript, they loved it. And today my fourth book is also with them. So I think it's it's that, I don't know where that man came from, who he was, uh, but he did awake that deep calling inside of me that I always wanted to do more for more people. And I thought that would be the best way then to do it. There, there you go. And... You know, um, I think all of us have stories in us and all of us have books in us. Um, and it doesn't matter that we don't know how at any given point. The question is, do we want to learn? It's a part of another adventure, which is part of life. And good for yeah. you that you're now on number four. When will it be out? Oh, I think that should be next year. Oh, cool. When did you write your first one? 2017 or 20, yeah, 2017, I started writing. 2018, it got published. That is exciting. Well, then it went 2018, 2020, and then 2023. And now next year. God will That's exciting. Um, I've written two, and number three will be out wow. next year. Um, and that's, we're excited about, about? Well, the first one was really my story, both in the World Trade Center and lessons I learned that helped me in the World Trade Center, um, lessons I learned as a blind person. So it's called Thunderdog. It's been on the New York Times bestseller list, and it was published in 2011. Then we wrote a children's version called Running with Roselle, which isn't so much about the World Trade Center as it is about uh, growing up as a as a blind boy, and then Roselle, who was the dog with me in the World Trade Center, her growing up, how we met, and then we, of course, do talk a little bit about the World Trade Center, but it's mostly about us growing up and our lives together. And the third book really came about because during the beginning of the pandemic, when travel for speaking died down, um, somebody pointed out, you know, you weren't afraid in the World Trade Center, you ought to talk to to people about controlling fear. And I agreed and thought a lot about that. And um, so started working on that. And it will come out next year. And the idea is it's a story about me and the eight dogs I've had as guide dogs, as well as Fantasia, who was a breeder for guide dogs for the blind, who became our, our family dog as well, but also my wife's service dog. And it's what we do is we talk about lessons that each of those dogs taught me about fear and how to control fear and how to work through fear and recognize that we don't need to be, as I call it, blinded by fear, but rather um, not overwhelmed by fear, but learn how to control fear and use fear as a very powerful tool to help us. And Absolutely. so it will it will help people, I hope, learn more about how they can not have to live their lives in fear. So it really talks a lot about a, a number of the things that we're talking about here. 
and um, and that we've talked about in the course of the day and learning to control the things we can and not worrying about the rest. So the title is Live Like a Guide Dog, um, and it'll be out next July or August, I believe. I look forward to it. It'll be fun. Well, I want to thank you for being on Unstoppable Mindset with us today. This has been absolutely enjoyable. How do people reach out to you if they'd like to talk with you more or maybe explore um, getting some assistance from you? Sure, Michael. They could reach us out on LinkedIn. Uh, They could say that they have heard us on this show with you and uh, they can connect with us on LinkedIn. They can follow us on Instagram. the website is spialnanjiani.com. That's can, exactly what Can you spell that, please? It's P as in Peter, A-Y-A-L, N as in Nancy, A-N-J-I-A-N-I. And what's your LinkedIn profile name? Pyal Nanjiani. There you go. So it makes it easy. Everything is easier done. Yeah. So they can always connect with us, connect with our team and to reach us out for anything. Well, I hope people will do that. You have offered a lot of great insights and things that we should learn and take to heart. So thank you very much for doing that and for being with us. And I want to thank you for listening. I would really appreciate it if when you uh, think about it, you would rate us and give us a rating. And we would love a five-star rating for this podcast. We hope that you liked it and you'll give us a five-star rating. I'd love to hear from you. You can reach me at michaelhi at accessibe.com. That's M-I-C-H-A-E-L-H-I at A-C-C-E-S-S-I-B-E.com. Or go to our podcast page, www.michaelhinkson.com slash podcast. And Michael Hinkson is M-I-C-H-A-E-L-H-I-N-G-S-O-N. So www.michaelhinkson.com slash podcast. Love those five-star reviews. Love any comments. And I'm sure Pyle would really appreciate you reaching out to her as well. So again, Pyle, I want to thank you for being here with us and helping us learn a lot in the course of this podcast and that a lot of people will reach out to you and um, that, that we're both able to help people moving forward. Michael. It's been an honor and a pleasure to be on your show. Thank you so much.